We had a great vacation. Had a wonderful time getting ready for the wedding uh, for Kayla and David. And um, that just Kathy just ran hither and yon, <laughs> and she does she does a good job at that. And I just went along with the ride. And uh, also, I just do want to extend my condolences to those of you whose NCAA tournament bracket was completely demolished by uh, by the uh, 14 seeds beating a number two seed. And oh, by the way, let's see here. Just, uh, uh, there, there's the bracket. Um, did we got we got eight games today. That, well, whatever. <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, we got uh, Maryland, Hawaii today, in Iowa, Illinois, Villanova, Oregon State. Oh, but oh, did you notice this one over here? <laughs> we're kind of kind of have have. I'm cheering for the Hoosiers, you know, <laughs> young kids. But anyway, and I understand that my team may not last long. Okay, <laughs> I I get that, but we're we're having fun with that while we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the reasons that it's good to live here is because we have elbow room. I mean, we have with foreign people come people come from other countries. I remember Christine came from Thailand. No, Taiwan. I think she's Taiwan on. That's right. <laughs> and 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 they couldn't believe how much space we have. You know, people from a another country with the big cities. You know, I imagine Chicago, New York. You know, right? I mean, we got space compared to there. It's like, and it's easy for to be in somebody else's space there because that's what you have to do. But here, don't get in my space. So it's really nice to have this elbow room. At one point on our trip, as Kathy and I were on the interstate, I said Interstate 75, and we were waiting in traffic and waiting. In fact, she said, we've only gone like three miles. I can't believe it. Yeah. And then she said, don't, aren't you glad you live in the UP? Now, normally that's rhetorical because, yeah, of course I'm glad I live in the UP. Um, but this time it was like, yeah, yeah, I really am glad I live in the UP. We have space that we can move. We don't have to deal with this stuff. We have, I told people down there, my uncles, went to visit them one morning, and I said, you know, we have four cars go by, and we think it's a traffic jam. <laughs> Where's all the traffic going around here? What's going on? Must be a parade. <laughs> oh, but but people, it's so crowded down there. We went to a ball game. We went to, or, went to see the Baltimore Orioles spring training. I know no one really wants to go see the Orioles, but we went there because they're in Sarasota, and we saw them play the Red Sox. And I noticed how packed it was there. They, were, they, they filled up. Every game is sold out. Every game, you know, at it's just crazy. And the crowds, it's interesting. The crowds you'll have, we'll be sitting there. And Kathy really didn't appreciate it too much because the, they do a lot of calisthenics, up and down, up and down, up and down. And, you know, they're, get, get the beer, get the beer, get the, you know. It's like $8 for a beer? Really? You need a beer that bad? I, you know, I'm just sitting there and watching all this happen. And, and, um, and there, but you know, there are Oriole fans here, and then there's Red Sox fans here, and then there's Oriole fans here because of the way they sell tickets. So that's not like a section of Orioles. It's not like a section of Red Sox fans. Like at Ingedine, you know, Deb has done a wonderful job of making sure the Ingedine fans sit in their section and that the visitors sit in their section, you know, because I don't think she wants any Ingrid mingling because it might be a fight or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But, but and what's interesting about that is when the cheering happens, like at the Orioles games, the Orioles would do something and a, s a smattering of people here and there would cheer. And the Red Sox would do something and it still seemed like a smattering of people here and there would cheer. But you go to Ingedine, where you're sitting and where you're supposed to sit or watch the NCAA tournament. They put the, the fans in their sections. Everybody, when IU does something great, everybody cheers. I guess not. <laughs> But when the other team does something great, their fans cheer too, right? So we have these groups and these groups and these groups cheering. It's a real mix. It's also interesting how um, people interact in reacting crowds. Um, it's real easy, I find, when I'm in a crowd of people that are like-minded for the same team to get vocal. You know what I mean? It's everybody's vocal around you, cheering, yeah, good play, yeah, good play. If I was by myself, sitting in the stands, and there was not many people there, I probably wouldn't cheer as loud. You know what I mean? Do you ever do that? So it's easy, and we get the crowd mentality going, don't we? And even if you're watching 
the Red Sox and Orioles, who I really don't care about. It doesn't matter to me who wins the game. It's a ball game. That's all, right? They're not the, it's not like the Cubs or the Tigers, you know. And, and the Cubs can lose and we still cheer. Actually, the Tigers can lose and we still cheer. <laughs> but um, so it doesn't matter. And so I still was cheering because it was a good play or something happened. You still cheer because the people around you impact what you're feeling and what's going on within you. And so um, that it's just kind of interesting. I watch that. In fact, if we look around, we see crowds of every shape and size. In fact, we're kind of a little bit of a crowd here today, which is really good. And I like to see to see that. Our daughter Andrea and her husband Daryl, um, they're going to uh, for this this year. It's going to be a bit more crowded for them. If you can notice the the mugs that Kathy and I have, we're going to be grandparents. <laughs> So we get to spoil somebody. <laughs> We're going to treat this child like it wasn't ours. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's looking to be a, it's going to be a great year for Kathy. We start off with a, with a Kathy and I, we start off with a fire, garage fire. Then we, we go to Kayla getting married. We go to having grandkids. And if IU wins the NCAA tournament, life will be great. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I, I said if, okay? <laughs> anyway, let me move on. Jesus experienced similar things. Now, yeah, he didn't experience the NCAA tournament, but he experienced crowds. Everywhere Jesus went, there were crowds. It got so bad he had to go on the water off a boat and preach one time. He couldn't go any place. And crowds were different sizes for different reasons. Like the time riding in the sand with a woman caught in adultery but he would no he couldn't go any place but with there was a crowd here he's teaching his disciples and i told him at nobin way i think it's really interesting how the disciples are all sitting there in a semicircle and i imagine jesus being ocd say okay listen guys let's let's sit alphabetical this in a semicircle here can we do this for the picture let's do this for the pi <laughs> no this is what it looks like to me but Jesus always had crowds. He couldn't go any place without a crowd. In fact, I think he was, he was like a superstar today. If they had a ball card, ball card for religious superstars, Jesus' card that would be the Rookie of the Year card, and everybody would want that card. I know this is Palm Sunday, and um, this, there we go. Here we teach on a hillside. This just doesn't work. There we go. It's Palm Sunday. And uh, we normally look at the triumphant entry of Jesus and with the crowd going into it. And we're going to look at that here in a little bit. But I want to I want to take some time and, and set the stage for us. We're going to go back to, if you want to open your Bibles, to the Gospel of John, Chapter 7. And I'm not going to really pick out the Scriptures. We're just going to kind of go through. I'm going to actually preach through John 7, from John 7 all the way through John 12. And you're going to go, wow, ah, it's going to be here forever. But no, we won't be. We're going to par I'm going to paraphrase some of the stories. We're going to look at the crowds a little bit and what the makeup of the crowds are and what's going on with the crowds. And this is hopefully going to set the stage for this week. This is coming into Holy Week. This is the week that for all Christians, all people who are followers of Jesus, this is our week. Now, we might say Christmas is our, our time, but this is our week. You know, it's uh, without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the death of burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ there would be no Christianity you know and you could say yeah without the birth of Jesus there would be no but you know it's yeah chicken and egg thing but we have to have this week and this is a big week for followers of Jesus now going back in John chapter 7 oh yeah, I don't need this I was going to show you my my NCAA tournament app on my phone it gives me updates all the time <laughs> Um, going in John chapter 7, Jesus is still in Galilee at the beginning of John chapter 7. And if you don't have a Bible, turn on your electronic equivalent. That'd be fine. And he's, he's in Galilee. And this is, understand, Galilee is where Jesus did 80% of his ministry. A lot of people, we think of Jesus preaching and going here and there. We think of Jerusalem. We think of Judea. But 80% of Jesus' ministry is done in Galilee. And then the rest of it, comes really toward the end here. I mean, he filtered in and out of Jerusalem in his ministry time, but the 
the lion's share was done in, Gal in, in the Galilee area. And it says in John chapter 7 that his, he was with his brothers at the beginning of John 7. He was with his brothers, and his brothers are giving him a hard time. They say, you know, you probably, if you're, if you're really who you say you are, you probably ought to go because the Feast of Booths was happening. Go to the feast and proclaim yourself. People need to know who you are. And it says in 7 that the brothers didn't believe he was who he said he was. Can you relate to that if you have family, brothers or sisters? There is no way my brother is the Messiah. You got, you know what he did when he was six? It was gross. The Messiah wouldn't do that, <laughs> you know? Can you just imagine for a moment? There's no way. Even though mom tells the story about how he was born and all that, I don't buy that. And so... They said they're going to this feast. And Jesus was going to say, I can't go because he understood it was not yet his time to be glorified. So he didn't go. Brothers take off, go to the feast. And it says that Jesus decides to go and he sneaks into the crowd of people. Into the crowd. Into the festival. What does Jesus do? He goes to the temple. Understand with his brothers, that's a small crowd goes to his brothers, or he goes to the temple in this feast, and he starts teaching in the temple, and he's calling out the Jews because they wanted to kill him. In verse 20 of chapter 7, it said, the crowd answered, you have a demon, who seeks to kill you? In other words, you're crazy, who wants to kill you? Nobody wants to kill you, you're nuts. So here we have another crowd. And in this crowd, some want him dead. Some possibly are on the fence about him. But verse 31 says, many believed in him. In fact, verse 40 says that the crowd was divided. Some thought he was a prophet. Some believed he was the Christ. And the rest really weren't sure what to believe. They couldn't believe that the Christ would come from Galilee. They couldn't believe like um, it was someone proclaimed early to Jesus. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? They couldn't see that. Can anything good come out of the UP? There's a lot of people that might believe something like that. But Jesus was coming out of Galilee. They couldn't believe that. Then that happens in crowds, doesn't it? People have different opinions. People have different ideas. People believe different things in crowds. And when you get crowds together, pretty soon they all start voicing the same thing, even though they believe different things. And let me just say this. Um, this is why it's so important in this series we're doing all year, the theme of believe, is it's so important we need to know what we believe, why we believe, and how to do it so we can stand firm on that belief when you're in a crowd that's trying to pull you another direction. It's so important to do that. Today we see crowds all over. Elections. huh? You watch... People are protesting a certain candidate. Crowd gathers to protest while that candidate may be making a speech someplace else and crowd people are crowding together because they like him and in the midst of it, somebody protests. Crowds are all over. Chapter 8, turn and flip there in your Bible if you will. Jesus tries to get a little get away and he went to the Mount of Olives, 8-1. But people find him. People tended to find Jesus and they formed a crowd and he starts teaching them, jumping down. A bit. Jesus starts teaching, then goes to the temple. And he's teaching in the treasury, and again he draws a crowd. And here he's he's telling them of where he came from, and he's telling them of his coming death. Of course, as usual, some people really don't understand. But verse thirty tells us that many came to believe, and and keep moving on. I and mean, we keep going on in these chapters here. Jesus does some more teaching, and some of the crowd wants to stone him, but he hides in the temple and gets away. Then in chapter 9, Jesus heals a man who's been blind since birth. And he, this is where they were asked, the disciples ask, who, who sinned, his mother and mom and dad? Why is this man blind? And Jesus said, no, nah, it's not about that. It's not about the blind person. It's not about mom and dad. It's about glorifying God. And that's a good thing for us to remember. We go through difficult times, we go through hard times, and so often it's about me. This time I'm going through, this rough time I'm having, God, why, this and that, it's not about you. Never has been, never will be. 
It's about giving glory where it's due, and that's to God and God alone. In the good times, in the bad times, in the everyday times, it's all about giving glory all the time where it's due. So, he goes to this blind man. He spits on the ground and he makes a little mud, which is really gross. His brothers might say, see? See what he's doing? He did that when he was a kid, too. He puts it on the man's eye and he tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. What's interesting about this, the man doesn't ask any questions. The man doesn't, doesn't seem to have any comments about it. man just goes and washes. Isn't that faith in action? Immediate obedience, instant obedience is happening right there. The man goes and washes. That's a lesson for us as well, to be instantly obedient to the call that Jesus has. And so this is in verse 25, 925, this is where the man says, when he's brought before the Pharisees, well, what happened? He says, I once was blind, I was blind, but now I see. And even though this blind man said this and believed in the power of Jesus, understand, he wasn't converted completely yet because Jesus wasn't done. Verse 35, it says that, let me back up one second. It's important to note, too, that this blind man was brought before the Pharisees, questioned who did this, how did they do this and all that. They weren't satisfied. They released him. Then they brought his parents in. His parents said, listen, he's old enough. He can answer for himself. And then they bring him back in, and that's when he says, he was once, he says, all I know is I was once blind, and now I see. Isn't that what the evidence, that's what he needs. It, uh, nothing else matters. You know, I can't tell you anything. I can't explain anything. I can't say it's a hocus-pocus thing. All I know is I can see, and I've never seen before. And it was a perfect 2020, wasn't it? So, Jesus is looking for this man. Jesus finds this man again in verse 35 in order to finish what he starts in this man. Here Jesus reveals himself, who he is to this man. The man makes a profession of faith, saying he believes in Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And what does he say? What does he do, I should say? He worships. When God is at work in our lives and we've witnessed his power, and we wouldn't understand his work and who he is, we should be at worship. It doesn't say he ran and told his friends. It doesn't say he told the priest. It doesn't say anything. He worshiped, and that is so important. And once again, a crowd of some size forms at this event, and they ask, are we blind too? And Jesus, once again, Jesus thins out potential believers with his answer. Take a look. At these words, the Jews were again divided. He, many of them said, He's a demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? Today, we're in the crowd. He speaks. They say, He's crazy. That's what they'd say, basically, right? He's nuts. You can't believe him. But others said, These are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Crowds, crowds, more crowds. Then Jesus does kind of the unthinkable. He's in ministry and somebody comes and says, Hey, your friend Lazarus is really sick. You better get over and heal him. Jesus takes his time. Jesus doesn't rush to the aid of Lazarus. Instead, Jesus allows Lazarus to die. Yeah. Jesus takes his time and gets there. Of course, his sisters are having a hard time with this. If you would have been here, Jesus, he would never have died. It even says that's where you get the scripture, Jesus wept. He wept over his friend, the loss of his friend, and when he saw what it did for them. And the crowd that was at the event were those who, even though they believed in his healing of the blind man, they said, yeah, he healed the blind man. We know this is chapter 11, verse 37. They doubted because he didn't keep Lazarus alive. Basically, Jesus didn't work 
the way they expected him to work. Don't we do that? We put expectations of Jesus on how he is to work in our lives, in the lives of friends or family members or whatever, and because it doesn't turn out the way we expect, all of a sudden he's wrong. Let me just reassure you, he's at work. He's working the things of the one who sent him. And when the times are tough, Jesus is at work. When the times are great, when it's easiest to praise him, Jesus is at work. When the times are mundane, Jesus is still at work. We don't always see him working. But just because he doesn't work the way you or I expect him to work doesn't mean he's not at work, does it? So, after this, Jesus takes time out from public ministry for a while. Sabbat- short, real short sabbatical. And six days before the Passover, as Zeke said, he's try- he decides he's going over to meal. You know, Mary and Martha, they put on a good feed. You get to see Lazarus again, see how he's doing. Of course, he knows how he's doing. You know, when you're healed by Jesus, you're healed by Jesus, right? You're healed, you know. So he goes over there. And it's interesting, it says that a large crowd, hearing he was there, came not only to see Jesus, but to see the evidence of his power, Lazarus. Crowds gathering again. Crowds who, people in that crowd probably wanted to see Jesus because they heard of him and maybe heard him before. But crowds gather because, oh, I got to, seeing is believing people. I got it. I got to. I got to see this Lazarus before I believe it. You know, I, I can't, I don't know. So there's the little doubters in that crowd. What kind of people are in a crowd that come together like this? And because Lazarus was the evidence, verse 10 of chapter 12 tells us that the priests were planning on killing him as well as killing Jesus. And it also tells us be, that because of Lazarus, many believed. This tells me that even though Jesus works in your life, there are plenty of people who don't want anything to do with Jesus, won't want anything to do with you because of the name of Jesus. And didn't Jesus tell us that many will hate you, but it's because of my name? It's not because of us, but it's because of his name. And, and you are so right, Pat. There's a lot of people, they love Jesus, but they don't like the church. In fact, Kyle Eidelman wrote a book like that, didn't he? <laughs> Something like that. Or somebody did. And we have to understand, that's when it gets tough. Because we are children. We are joint heirs with Jesus. We're children of the king. And they're, they're defaming our king. They're defaming him. And we take that personally. And we should take it personally. But not to the point of thinking about us, knowing it's about him. In the long run, it will always be about him. Now, we come to the triumphal entry. This is when Jesus tells his disciples, go steal a donkey. This is when we have Palm Sunday. (laughs) And if you were here last year, remember the video we did? Palm Sunday, I thought it was about Palm Sunday. Um, Jesus tells his disciples, go borrow a donkey. He says, hey, there's a guy waiting down there who has a donkey. Tell him that your master, and if he asks you when you take the donkey, what are you doing with the donkey? Tell him your master needs the donkey, and he'll give it to you, which is pretty cool. You know. So he goes. They go get the donkey. They bring the donkey back. Jesus gets on the donkey. Why does he ride the donkey in? Because he's fulfilling a prophecy. So he rides the donkey in down the hill, the Mount of Olives, on the way to Jerusalem, going into Jerusalem. And what happens when Jesus comes riding a donkey? Crowds form again, right? Crowds. People come to see him. you got the disciples. you got people. And what are they doing? They're, they're laying the coats down before him, rolling out the carpet, so to speak. They're taking palm. They're cutting branches off the trees, which I, in Florida we saw palm trees. And I'm thinking, how long does it take to, sh- to shinny up a tree and cut a branch and bring it down just to lay it down, you know. But, so it must have been a sm- small pineapple palm or something like that, you know, because it's not happening that way. But I did decide, by the way, side note, I did decide that palm trees would be great if you had a climber.
were hunting. <laughs> I, I, so that's, yeah, that's a problem, but it still would be great. Okay, back to that. Let me get back to it. Now. So anyway, so so Jesus is riding in on the donkey. And imagine this crowd that's forming, this crowd that's there. Who's there in the crowd? Just imagine with me now for a little bit. If you have to close your eyes, do, but don't fall asleep because your neighbor's going to wake you up. Um, and it'll be embarrassing. So who's there in the crowd? The crowd's filled with a mixed group of people. We, know, we do know that scribes, Sadducees, and Pharisees are probably there because any place Jesus was, he tended to draw those people because they're trying to kill him anyway. And we're pretty sure that Roman soldiers were there because anytime a crowd gathered near Jerusalem, Jesus, they're going to have to keep the order, right? But who else is there? They're probably friends and families of the blind man that was healed. Hey, Jesus is, in, is here in town. Let's go see him. He's coming in on the donkey. How about those who witnessed the resurrection of Lazarus? Oh, I got to see how he's going to do again. He's coming in on a donkey. How cool is that? Those who heard the teachings of Jesus were probably there. Probably those who were going to the town for the festivities, for the Passover. So those who knew Jesus and were believing in him, what do they do? They start cheering. What do they say? Anybody? Hosanna! The son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And their Savior was coming in, riding on a donkey. And the Savior is coming on his steed, and he's going to save them. And they have this mentality of somebody coming in on a warring steed that's going to raise a war, that's going to fight a battle for him, and stuff like that, right? Understand that the Romans did this too. When they won a battle, they would come in with all their horses. They would come in all the troops. And they would come in marching and they'd lead the captives in too. And the captives many times would have to be put into the Colosseum and they'd be fighting battles. And they'd have a big parade. But this, I'm sure the Roman soldiers were laughing at this one. And look, at th- look at these Jews. I mean, this is all they got. A guy on a donkey. Yeah. So he rides into Jerusalem. And what they don't seem to see as he's cheering is going on is that Jesus is weeping during this time over Jerusalem. Sometimes our crowd mentality fogs our vision of what Jesus is really wanting and seeing. Sometimes we don't get the heart of Jesus because he's not living up to the expectations of us. They're cheering for their Savior riding in a donkey, but he's not the Savior they thought who rides in preparing for battle. Oh, understand that Jesus is preparing for battle. But also know that he's going to lose the physical battle, but he's winning the spiritual battle. He was preparing for a battle that they couldn't see, preparing for a battle they couldn't understand. All they could see was he was going to come and deliver them from oppression. How about you? Is Jesus working the way you think he should work? And this happens to be just something physical, here and now? We don't see the spiritual side? Paul said, open the eyes of my heart so that I might see. One more thing to note is that in the other three Gospels, Jesus is shown going into the temple and cleansing the temple, drawing a crowd, then cleansing a temple. But in John, Jesus gives a teaching, calling people to himself, telling people of his relationship to the Father. And then he adds this. My soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? That's what I would say. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then this amazing thing happens. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it, done already, past tense, and will glorify it again, future. This is the third time that the voice of God in the New Testament has been audibly heard by human beings. The first time was when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. The voice came out of heaven as Jesus came up out of the water and said, this, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. That's how he had been glorified. 
The second time was on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him up to the Mount, and they saw the vision of Elijah and Moses. And then God's voice came down to shut Peter up and said, This is my son, listen to him. And now this time. And then what Jesus tells them, um, so God speaks to the crowd publicly again, and Jesus tells them this, says this. So the crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered. Others were saying, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for yours. God is talking so you can hear. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And that's where the cheers should really happen. And then Jesus tells them again how he will die. And if and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. The crowd then answered him, We have heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? The crowd heard it, but they still didn't get it. And so the question is for us today. Of all these crowds, all the groups in the crowds, which crowd are you in? And which group are you in? Are you in the group that hears Jesus and his message and keeps coming to hear, but isn't affected? Or maybe you like the blind man and Lazarus. They had a personal encounter with Jesus and were changed forever. And I submit to you that if anybody has an encounter with Jesus, you are always changed. Or are you in the group, in the crowd that has heard Jesus and says, yes, I believe, and you believe with all your heart, just like that. Maybe you're in the group, in the crowd that just refuses to believe, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Can't, nothing good can come out, come out of Galilee. Or you can't believe, even though you've actually heard the voice of God. And finally, there are those in the crowd that are so impacted by culture and things around them that they just aren't impacted at all. They're totally ambivalent of who's right in front of them. All they want is just to be somewhere and with a group of people. I think at times, if we're honest, we're in one or several of these groups. I think our group changes. So my challenge for you this week. Think about this. Which crowd are you in? The crowd of believing, the crowd of change, the crowd of serving, the crowd, whatever crowd. Which crowd are you in? And then do something about it. We're going to be looking at crowds later this week, too. Father God.